Good afternoon. My name is Adriana Link, and I'm the head of scholarly programs at the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to today's virtual discussion with Tom Chafin, author of Odyssey, Young Charles Darwin, The Beagle, and The Voyage That Changed the World, published this February by Pegasus Books. We're really happy to have so many of you join us today. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging that the American Philosophical Society resides in what is now known as Philadelphia, which is in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose relationships and connections with the land continue to this day and into the future. In recognizing this, the society expresses its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of the Lenape, as well as that of numerous other indigenous communities uh, and individuals throughout this continent who have offered guidance, expertise, uh, and opportunities for collaboration. Their generosity makes the work of the Society's Library and Museum possible. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The Society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who have made exceptionally significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The Society promotes research by providing over a million and a half dollars in research grants a year, primarily to younger scholars uh, who need the support the most. Our library and museum, collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. Uh, please check out our website, www.amphilsoc.org, uh, to learn more about what we do and for news of upcoming events. And we've added that link uh, to the chat uh, for you to peruse. We're using Zoom webinar for today's discussion, so not to worry, uh, you've all been muted. Uh, if you have a question, however, uh, the best way to get our attention and to ask it is to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your navigation bar. Uh, and you can type a question in there at any time during today's uh, discussion, and there'll be plenty of time at the end of our conversation for questions uh, with our speaker. Uh, we're also excited to offer closed captioning for today's discussion. So if you would like to use it, uh, please click on the CC box uh, on the bottom navigation bar of Zoom, it is to the right of the Q&A button. I'm especially excited to host uh, today's discussion about Darwin's early life and career, as it provides an opportunity to highlight the APS's holdings uh, related to the history of science. Uh, the APS's library and museum uh, contains materials representing uh, scientific disciplines ranging from astronomy uh, to early natural history to 20th century biology and the life sciences to quantum physics and computing. Uh, it also houses the personal papers and correspondence of seven Nobel laureates. And for the purposes of today's talk, I'm very excited uh, to highlight that the APS uh, also houses the largest collection of um, uh, manuscript material, materials related to Darwin uh, outside of the UK, uh, along with the Valentine Darwin Collection, uh, which is a uh, collection of nearly 5,000 copies of Darwin's writings and publications appearing in numerous different languages. And it's really a, a terrific resource for those uh, who are scholars of, of Darwin and his writing and his life. Uh, and you can learn more about all of our history of science collections, including our Darwin materials in the link in the chat. Uh, with that, though, I'm very pleased to turn things over to today's speaker, uh, Tom Chafin, who is the author uh, of books including Revolutionary Brothers, Giant's Causeway, Sea of Grey, and Pathfinder. Uh, he received his master's in American studies from NYU and his PhD in US history from Emory. His writings have also appeared in the New York Times, the Oxford American, Time, Harper's, as well as other publications. And he just let me know that he has an article uh, coming out soon uh, related to uh, the topic of today's discussion that will appear in the Annals of the New York Academy of Science. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome Tom and uh, we'll share some information throughout the presentation on how you can purchase a copy of the book, uh, which is the topic of today. So uh, Tom, I'll invite you to uh, come on screen now. Great, I see you and you're ready to go. Yeah, okay, good, good. Well, thank you, Adriana, for that, for those kind words and for organizing this event. I like, likewise thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. I thank you for your time and for your interest in my new book, Odyssey, Young Charles Darwin, The Beagle, and The Voyage That Changed the World. I'm honored to speak to the American Philosophical Society today. And while it's the first time that I've been so privileged 
the experience somehow feels like familiar ground for, for me. Um, to wit, um, my last book, Before Odyssey, bears the title Revolutionary Brothers, Thomas Jefferson, the Marquis de Lafayette, and the friendship that helped forge two nations. The book was published in late 2019 in what now seems like about five minutes before COVID shut down the world. And when Adri Adriana originally contacted me about speaking today, I imme immediately recalled an event depicted in Revolutionary Brothers in which American Philosophical Society member, the Marquis de Lafayette spoke before the society on August 12th, 1784. His topic, alas, was the, quote, wondrous effects, close quote, of the German physician and showman Fred Franz Mesmer's even then widely discredited theories of what, of what Mesmer called, quote, animal magnetism. Well, suffice it to say that by the time I conclude today, I trust you'll agree with me that the scientific legacy of my topic today, Charles Darwin, enjoys better odds than Dr. Mesmer's theories of surviving for posterity. So without further ado, let me tell you about my new book, otherwise known around my house as my pandemic lockdown project. Charles Darwin lived from 1809 to 1882. He first saw the light of day in the small town of Shrewsbury, England, where he was born on February 12, 1809. That same day, that very same day, thousands of miles to the west, in a rough-hewn log cabin in Kentucky, the infant Abraham Lincoln also first saw the light of day. Of the circumstances associated with the two men's respective births, however, those attending Darwin's could not have been more propitious than those of Lincoln's humble origins. Charles was the fifth of six children born to physician and investor Robert Waring Darwin and his wife, Susanna, daughter of industrial ceramics magnate, Josiah Wedgwood. Shrewsbury lies in Shropshire, then and today a landlocked, largely rural county in England's West Midlands. In Shrewsbury, Robert Darwin, prospered through a medical practice that served prominent families in the area. Prudent investments augmented his wealth, local rental properties and stocks in railroads and canals. Charles's mother, Susanna, a, cultural, a cultured woman whose piano teachers included Frederick Chopin, died when, she, when he was eight years old. Afterwards, Charles grew up in a household run by a matriarch composed of his three older teenage sisters. Charles grew up with insatiable curiosities, mostly focused on the rural natural world that surrounded him. Indeed, during those years, he compulsively collected, among other items, birds, eggs, insects, postage stamps, and rocks. However, in the local private boarding school that he attended in Shrewsbury, and later at Edinburgh and Cambridge universities, he proved himself an indifferent student. By now, in popular imagination, as in this photograph of the scientist taken four years before his death, the face of Charles Darwin comes to us wizened with lines of age and framed by the Old Testament prophet's beard by which the world in 1859 first came to know him. That was the year when, at the age of 50, he published his groundbreaking book on the origin of species. To be sure, we have scores of contemporary portraits of the scientists from that era and later, many of them photographs. By contrast, we have but two portraits of Charles, neither of them photographs rend re rendered before his 30th year. But despite, the, but, but despite that shortage of youth, youthful portraits, without D Darwin's travels between 1831 and 1836, aboard HMS Beagle, he likely would not never have written The Origin of Species. According to popular lore, sailing aboard the Beagle, Darwin visited the Pacific Ocean's remote Gal Galapagos Islands. There he noticed some interesting tortoises and birds and voila. Then and there, his soon famous theory burst into his head. After which, he quickly returned to England and promptly wrote Origin of Species. As Darwin himself put it in his posthumously, posthumously published autobiography, quote, the voyage of the Beagle has been by far the most important event in my life and determined my whole career. 
In that autobiography written in Darwin's later years, he reflected on the qualities that enabled his success as a scientist. I think that I am superior to the common run of men in noticing things which easily escape attention and in observing them carefully. My industry has been nearly as great as it could have been in the observation and collection of facts. From my early youth, I have had the strongest desire to understand or explain whatever I observed, that is to group all facts un under some general laws. These causes combined have given me the patience to reflect or ponder for any number of years over my unexplained problem. Even so, as the poet Homer observes in the Odyssey, quote, the gods don't hand out all of their gifts at once. In his autobiography, Darwin also assessed the price paid for the intellectual attainments of his later years, a price that included the, lies, the loss of the artistic pleasures of his youth. Quote, my mind has changed during the last 20 or 30 years, he lamented. Up to the age of 30 or beyond it, Poetry of many kinds, such as the works of Milton, Gray, Byron, Wordsworth, Coleridge, and Shelley gave me great pleasure. Moreover, he added, I have almost lost my taste for pictures or, or music. Music, formerly a source of great pleasure, generally sets me thinking too energetically on what I have been at work on instead of giving me pleasure. Indeed, as I conducted my own research for my book, and discovered these often sharp demarcations between Darwin's youth and later years, and his later years, I realized that they've led to a host of misconceptions concerning his life and works. And for this afternoon's present purposes, I've distilled some of those misconceptions into a list of five. Let's begin with the one that heads my list. Misconception number one, that the Beagle was dispatched to the Galapagos on a scientific expedition. Well, while Beagle's, Darwin's Beagle travels did shape his career as a scientist, that, the purposes of, of that expedition were in truth primarily commercial, economic, and political, and only inadvertently scientific. The Beagle's now famous five-week five week call in the Galapagos, in fact, belonged to a five-year global, global ex, uh, British Navy surveying expedition. More specifically, the Beagle had been commissioned to conduct marine surveys of selected coastlines and ports, mainly in South America. Britain during those years was competing with various European states as well as the United States for increased trade with Brits, Portugal's and Spain's former colonies in the New World by then newly independent states. And for British officials, that competition demanded updated maps of those in other waters nautical charts whose production required fresh marine surveys. Misconception number two, Darwin served aboard the Beagle as the ship's official naturalist. It's true that Darwin, by the conclusion of the Beagle's voyages, voyage, was informally recognized as the ship's naturalist. In truth, however, he played no formal role aboard the Beagle, nor in its survey work. When the Beagle departed England, in 1831, Darwin was a 22 year old aspiring but unknown naturalist. And at that one who hoped to make his name as a geologist, not a biologist. His invitation to accompany the voyage came from the ship's captain, Robert Fitzroy, who had served on an earlier global survey involving the Beagle and another ship. During that voyage, the expedition's original commander, overcome by depression during an anchorage at Tierra del Fuego, had locked himself in his cabin and put a bullet in his head. For Fitzroy, who ultimately replaced the deceased commander and who himself was subject to depression with a recent suicide in his own family, the late captain's death served as a cautionary tale. Thus, soon after learning that he was to command a second expedition to many of the same destinations, Fitzroy, to relieve the isolation that otherwise would accompany that command, struck upon an idea. Why not invite a civilian to accompany the voyage, someone outside the ship's chain of command with whom he might share his dinner table? Even better, find one who shared his interest in natural history. Such regular company, Fitzroy reasoned, might lessen his own odds of replicating his predecessor's downward spiral. 
Misconception number three. The author of Voyage of the Beagle spent most of those five years of travel at sea. Well, in Darwin's case, to call his five years of Beagle-associated travel a, a voyage is misleading. In the end, he actually spent three-fifths of those five years of travels on land, three years and three months on land versus a total of 535 days on water. How was that, you might ask? Well, as an, as an inspiring naturalist and determined to maximize opportunities to collect natural specimens, Darwin accompanied the survey expedition with the understanding that he would be allowed to leave the ship at will. Typically, his overland travels, co conducted with hireling, hireling local guides after arranging to meet the Beagle at another port, lasted days, weeks, or even months. So why, if Darwin spent most of his time on land during those years, did, in, did he entitle his account of it, The Voyage of the Beagle? The simple answer is he didn't. Darwin's account of his Beagle travels, originally published in 1839 under the bland title, Journal and Remarks, belonged to a three volume quasi official account of the by then two global survey expeditions with, it, with which the Beagle had been associated. Not until 1905, Decades after its author's death, did the, Beagle, did the book appear under the title by which later readers came to cherish it, The Voyage of the Beagle. As a side note, if I may digress, Darwin's contribution to the multi-volume Beagle publication project, his volume, now known as Voyage of the Beagle, drew on a lively diary that he kept during his travels. Compelling writing fills many of Voyage of the Beagle's pages. Even so, for reasons of concision and content, about half of his diary's words failed to make it into the published book. Most particularly, Charles excluded many non-survey related topics, personal tribulations, and materials that Captain Fitzroy, who oversaw the, oversaw the project, might deem irrelevant, frivolous, offensive, or for pro proprietary reasons, wanted to rope off for himself to describe. Typifying that deference was Darwin's treatment of a noteworthy anchorage in Tierra de Fuego where the ship repatriated three natives of the area. The three had been inadvertently kidnapped during the ship's first expedition and taken to England for instruction in Anglican Christianity and the virtues of English civilization. The repatriation of the natives and their interaction with other natives, as Darwin makes clear in his diary and letters, fascinated him as much as anything he witnessed during the entire voyage, including the Galapagos. But in deference to Fitzroy, in Voyage of the Beagle, Darwin declined to describe the episode or to express his thoughts concerning what he had witnessed. We stayed there for five days, Darwin wrote in Voyage of the Beagle. Captain Fitzroy has given an account of all the interesting events which there happened. As Oscar Hammerstein might say, it's good to be the captain. Additionally, in Voyage of the Beagle, because the ship made repeated visits to several anchorages, anchorages, Darwin strayed from his diary's chronological structure to organize voyages of Voyage of the Beagle's chapters by place. In the end, however, those and other editorial decisions, in my view, sacrificed much of his diary's drama narrative cohesion, candor, topical breadth, and intimacy. The latter what Darwin called the, quote, chit chat details of my journal. In creating my own narrative of Darwin's travel, I elected to tap into the full breadth of his writings, both published and unpublished. Moreover, in depicting events associated with his Beagle's travel, Beagle travels, I decided early on in my research for Odyssey to accord primacy not to Voyage of the Beagle, but to writings created during his travels, his diary, field notebooks, and letters. Typically, typically those letters, colorful and robustly detailed, and often crackling with an intimate immediacy unfound in Voyage of the Beagle, were sent to family members and friends. For further illumination, I also drew on the correspondence, memoirs, and diaries of others he encountered or traveled with during those years. Indeed, in drawing on the full breadth of Darwin's writings created during those years, I discovered a spirit possessed of an en energy and imagination that I did not expect to find. Moreover, I happily found that spirit not dissimilar to that which animates the best works of such 
writers, esteemed writers as Lord Byron, Jules Verne, and Mary Shelley, and for that matter, even Homer and Jack Kerouac. To wit, beyond Darwin's expected interest in science and nature, myriad other topics in, enliven his Beagle writings, including politics, missionaries, fashion, colonialism, race, slavery, architecture, women, South American and Australian cities, history, Tahitian royalty, gauchos, the British empire, indigenous peoples, shopping and cuisine. Moreover, his dispatch of those and other unexpected topics in my view, showcased his often underestimated gifts as a writer. Now, to return to our parade of misconceptions, Misconception number four, throughout his life as the quintessential Victorian scientist, Darwin was bookish, reclusive, and singularly focused. Well, in 1839, a few years after his return, Charles married his first cousin, the former Emma Wedgwood. She was 30, he was 29. And over the coming years, they had 10 children, seven of whom survived into adulthood. And during his middle years, Charles was often beset with illnesses and those circumstances, growing familiar responsibilities and poor health kept him, did keep him close to home. Indeed, after his return from his Beagle travels, he never again set foot outside of Britain. However, during his earlier years, especially during his Beagle travels, he was tall, lean and fit. Moreover, he had diverse interests and exemplified good health. Impressively, between 1831 and 1836, it visited port, ports or places, passed on overland outings. Darwin, then his 20s, relished spending a few hours or an entire day climbing each area's, area's highest mountain, whether in Brazil, Argentina, Tierra del Fuego, Uruguay, Chile, the Galapagos, Tahiti, New Zealand, Australia, Tasmania, or Mauritius. And yes, he did climb the uh, statue on which today's uh, Christ the Redeemer uh, statue, uh, the mountain on which Christ, the, in, in outside of Rio, uh, in which the statue of Christ the Redeemer now stands. Um, beyond that, thanks, beyond those climbing adventures, thanks to years of experience with firearms and mounted hunting excursions in England, Darwin impressed even Argentina's gauchos with his marksmanship. He, he also savored extended journeys on horseback over often difficult, even dangerous terrains, in, including mountains, plains, jungles, and even South America's Atacama Desert. Misconception number five, the Galapagos produced the Eureka moment when Darwin first conjured his theory of evolution. Well, that's a good story. And as Hemingway made, might say it would be pretty to think so. But truth be known for Darwin, his now storied five weeks in the Galapagos produced no Eureka moment. In fact, he embarked on and returned from the voyage as a creationist. His belief in what he later called the fixity of species still intact. More to the point, only after Darwin's return from his Beagle travels and only after others had inspected the specimens he collected in the Galapagos did he appreciate appreciate the island to island species variants among the birds and tortoises he had gathered there. Indeed, while Darwin had nursed lifelong interest in natural history, his Cambridge de degree completed mere months before his departure aboard the Beagle was the sort obtained by young men preparing for the Anglican ministry, the very vocation he had planned to pursue upon his return to England. Furthermore, after returning to England in 1836, he did not publish Origin of Species until 23 years later. Now, because the Galapagos are, are by now so widely viewed as the hallowed grounds where Darwin first conceived his theory of evolution, I want to conclude by saying a few, thing, few more things about his time there. As I noted earlier, the Beagle spent just five weeks in the Galapagos, five weeks out of five years of global travels four years of which were spent in South America. From the journal and field notes that Darwin kept and his letters home, we know that he was taken by the Galapagos, that he was impressed by, by the archipelago, not only with its flora and fauna, but equally so with its myriad dormant volcanoes. 
But in truth, he saw nothing earth shattering about the islands. For instance, none of his writings from the voyage even make mention of the famous group of avian species now called Darwin's Finches, Finches whose differing beaks would bolster his later theory of evolution. Indeed, his diary's coverage of his Galapagos visit contains only one reference and at that a passing reference to any sort of finch. But if Darwin didn't write about the finches while he was in the Galapagos, he certainly collected them there, shooting and preparing specimens that he sent to England. But in a lapse from his, from his usual attention to detail and one that shows how little attention he was paying to island paying to island, to island diversity, he commingled the birds failing to re record on their labels the specific island on which each had been killed. Indeed, not until 1837 in London, after the expedition's return and the bird's inspection by zoologist John Gould, did Darwin come to recognize the vari variations among the finches. It was during those nine months, by the way, that he started keeping what scholars now call Darwin's notebooks B and C, the ones returned to Cambridge uh, last month. And it was in those notebooks that he com commenced the speculation that eventually led to his theory of evolution. But that's getting ahead of our story. To return to the Galapagos, similar to Darwin's pursuit of birds there, he likewise noted and recorded the behavior of the tortoises on the islands. But once again, he failed to notice the species differences among them. In their case, not until the Galapagos' governor brought them to his attention, and as with the birds, it was another scientist later on, the French herpetologist, Gabriel Biron, who had studied specimens from other Galapagos, er, er, earlier Galapagos expeditions who confirmed for Darwin those variances. Late in life, Darwin was asked directly whether he had been an evolutionist during his beagle travels. I believed in the permanence of species, he answered. As far as I can rem remember, Vague doubts occasionally flitted across my mind, but I did not become convinced that species were mutable until two or three years had elapsed. So how then did the Galapagos become synonymous with Darwin's theoretical leap? Well, it just so happens that John Van Wy, a talented Cambridge trained historian of science at the University of Singapore recently traced the, line the, the linkage. Initially, and for 50 years after Darwin's death in, in 1882, Van Wy observed, quote, most accounts of the origins of Darwin's theory attribute no particular significance to his visit there as compared to South America, close quote. Over time, however, the fact that Darwin's theory had eventually made significant use of Galapagos e evidence morphed into a eureka moment. By Van Wy's count in the early 20th century, about a quarter of publications referencing Darwin had him discovering evolution while he was in the Galapagos. Then in 1935, the centennial of the, of the Beagle, Beagle's Galapagos visit, a group sailing from San Francisco and calling itself the Darwin Memorial Expedition added to the linkage. During a two year voyage, the party members unveiled a monument on the Galapagos where Darwin first went ashore. The inscription read in part, Charles Darwin let, landed on the Galapagos Islands in 1835, and his studies thereon led him for the first time to consider the problem or, of organic evolution. Thus was started that revolution in thought and which has, uh, in thought on this subject, which has since taken place, close quote. Later that same year, a conference of British academics ratified the connection. They devoted an entire session to papers on the quote, centenary of the landing of Darwin on the Galapagos Islands and of the birth of the hypothesis of the origin of species, close quote. As Van Wy writes, quote, now for the first time, Darwin was widely represented, of dis represented as discovering evolution on the Galapagos. The title of this session alone was repro reproduced in newspapers and journals throughout the world, close quote. Well, by now 200 years after Darwin set sail on the Beagle, the notion that the Galapagos chain is literally the birthplace of the theory of evolution is commonplace. Among scientists and other intellectual pioneers, however, such breakthroughs rarely arrive as blinding revelations. Instead, they tend to emerge from plotting, cumulative, laborious work, trial and error, 
even happenstance. And thus for Darwin, there was no revelation in the Galapagos, no epiphany among the tortoises and the finches there. Much like the island's inhabitants, the scientists and the science had to evolve. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom, for this uh, introduction to what is no doubt a, a much more nuanced and, and, and detailed uh, account in the book. Um, so I, I just want to uh, to note for folks, if you haven't already had a chance to uh, explore the uh, the website link uh, to purchase the book, uh, we'll put the, put the link in there and uh, this will take you directly to uh, signed copies of, of Tom's book. And for those of you who may have already uh, purchased a copy, um, if you would like to receive a signed uh, book plate, um, my colleague Nathan Kinsey will put his email in the chat and you feel free to send him an email uh, to receive a signed book plate. So lots of ways to purchase and also to get your own signed autographed uh, version of the book. Um, Tom, I really appreciate uh, the work that you're, you're doing with this project. And we were talking at the beginning here about the, the, the kind of trouble of getting into, into the business of writing about Darwin, uh, since he is somebody who, who has been written about quite extensively. Um, so I'd love to hear, just to kind of begin our conversation, um, why did you choose to write about Darwin? You, you've written about so many different peoples and about so many different areas of the world. What drew you to Darwin as a figure, uh, as, the, as the subject of, of this book, book project, your pandemic project, as you, as you call it? I confess it was after I, I read uh, uh, um, the recent biography of, of, of a hum, Humboldt, um, um, the, the Prussian explorer. I want to say Alex, is it Alexander? I'm thinking of the, I get that confused with the Salbella novel, the same. Anyway, uh, but Andrea Wolf, I, I think is the author's name. And uh, I was enjoying that. And then it, it, it brought to mind, uh, I, my second book was a, was a biography of the explorer of the American West, John Fremont, who was also a, a, a scientific explorer um, he laid the groundwork for the, I mean, he just, he basically mapped and surveyed what, what became known as the, or, as the Oregon Trail, which during the 1840s was, uh, after publication of Darwin, of Charles Fremont's maps um, and journals prompted the first mass migration of, of whites in, into the American Trans-Mississippi West and, and as, far, as far as the West Coast. Anyway, but, um, Fremont and Darwin were both um, admirers of Humboldt. I mean, they, they, uh, as, as were a lot of other explorers of that generation. Um, so anyway, the more I thought about it, I was I was thinking I was thinking that I'd never read a, a like a a book that's strictly focused on Darwin's explorations. Uh, the uh, I mean, all Darwin biographies include like you know maybe a. 50 or 100 pages on, on his, his um, Beagle, five years of Beagle travels. But anyway, so that's how I sort of drifted into the subject. And, no, then, the, and then the lockdown happened. And so it was like, <laughs> I was working on it like seven days a week, 12 hours a day. I mean, maybe it was something yeah. about the condition of being locked indoors that you wanted to live vicariously. Well, yeah, it, was, it, was a, it was a great uh, sort of diversion from the twin perils of uh, uh, preoccupations of, of uh, COVID and Donald Trump, I mean, you know, to be honest. Uh, fair enough. I mean, we were all, all were looking for some escapism, I think, during that time. Uh, on the topic of, of kind of early influences of, of Darwin, of course, his grandfather was Eura Erasmus Darwin, and, and uh, you mentioned Humboldt. There were several other uh, people who sort of influenced his early years in scholarship. Can you talk a little bit more about those various influences and how you see them uh, perhaps uh, channeled through his later writings? Well, his, his, his uh, grandfather, who... who um died I think, a few months before Charles was born, or Dar Char Charles never met his, his grandfather, but he was a, a very celebrated uh, uh, intellectual and, and author and, and physician of, of 18th century Britain. And he's, he's often um, associated with a, a his own theory of evolution. But I would say that just to, as a cautionary note, him, uh, 
Erasmus Darwin, who was heavily influenced by the French biologist Lamarck, they, they both, and there were some other figures who had used, who had sort of talked about the de or de development of species. The, the difference between them and what, and what and, um, they tended to have a, a view that of whether it was God or, or some sort of you know, creator that as being a kind of grand architect. So it was, it was kind of a teleological unfolding of, of um, you know, preordained events. Uh, and Darwin was looking for something that was more, uh, um, what's the word, Imp improvisational or more subject to chance and, you know, current contemporary, uh, um, didn't have a priori origins. That's, I, I don't think I put that very well, but. Uh, maybe. No, but I, I mean, I, but I think what you're, what you're you're sort of showing that there, there are these multiple influences yeah. that are happening in this, yeah. this 19th century moment where, where people are trying to kind of make connections uh, to, to this greater worldview. And, and of course, Humboldt is, is doing that as well. Uh, and, and, you, and I think you do see it um, as Darwin is sort of putting the pieces together in, in leading up to the, to the publication of uh, On the Origin. I think with Humboldt, the, the main influence was just as a kind of a role model. And he, 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 uh, he, he just gave him the, a lust imparted his Humboldt's writings imparted for Darwin or just a kind of lust for travel. I mean, he had not, um, I think up until um, he left on the Beagle, I think he'd been like, he traveled around uh, uh, England and in, in, in Scotland, he'd been, he, he went to, he had been a one visit, like three weeks visit to Paris, which was by the way, his only time he ever stepped on the European mainland. Uh, and he had made a, another trip to Ireland very briefly, but him, other than that, he had not done any really substantial travel. I love this question that just came in from, from Richard Lenski. And, and I'll, I'll uh, again, remind folks that if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A. Um, who, who asks that you explain that the Galapagos and the voyage of the Beagle were not epiphany moments. And, and I think you, you show that, that there is this kind of gradual process and, and people have written about this before. Um, do you see anything that's close to an epiphany moment uh, in, in his correspondence or notebook? So uh, Richard mentions the, the famous uh, drawing of the tree of life and the words, I think. So wondering in the time that you've spent going over um, Darwin's personal correspondence and, and notebooks, if you, if you begin to see kind of these, these aha moments, or, or is it really as, as gradual as, as, as you kind of articulate and others have as well? Um, those tend to occur after he completed his, his um, travels, the, the notebook, to which you refer was, I think, like the, the drawing. That was two or three years later, and I think um, most Darwin scholars uh, would would tell you that that was, in a, that was the the sort of uh, manifestation of an epiphany that he had after after reading uh, Thomas Malthus's essay on populations. Um, but as as far as during the during his travels, he he unearthed a, a fossil of a of a, a a giant ground sloth in in um, in Patagonia in South America, and while he didn't know exactly what he had was seeing, he 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 sensed that he was he was on the right road. And it was just, it was something that uh, bagged all kinds of questions. And, and um, the, the other thing is, you know, his, his primary mentor uh, in those years was a, a ge geologist, Charles Lyle, who, who was, who, who with his fellow Scotsman, James Hutton, had, was challenging the, the notion um, that geologists in deference to 
theology had had um, embraced for many years that the the uh, um, the that the world's age was no longer was 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 not older than the Bible's account of it. So, and I think I think there was a Bishop Usher who had co contemplated it was six thousand years. So. Lyle and these and sort of newer geologists were challenging that and showing that uh, you know that the world was much older than that and that was that was the first kind of scientific heresy that uh, inhabited Darwin's thinking I think. So I just added in the chat uh, a link to some of our holdings um, that that sort of document Darwin's correspondence with Lyle that, that covers some of this material. Yeah. So if folks are interested, I do encourage you uh, to take a look at that. And, and, and kind of going back to this aha moment, I, I want to maybe I'll see if I can share my screen quickly, if I can do this. Um, let's see, I'll move this over here. So, so we do have in our collections um, draft pages from, from Darwin's uh, work on on origin, and, and you can see here, you know how much editing is is kind of happening. And and I'm, I'm I was struck by your your mention of of the other authors who are working in the 19th century and in the ways that you're you're kind of uh, lumping Darwin in with these people. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it's it's th th these things do kind of evolve over time, as you point out. So I think it, it's very illuminating to see both familiar language in these draft texts that we have in our collections uh, and, and then being able to compare this with, with what we know to be the, the kind of final version of these texts. So I'll put this link in the chat as well for folks who might uh, want to uh, explore this. Um, I guess one thing that I'd like to ask you, Tom, is, sure. is, is kind of thinking about the, the celebrity of Darwin. And, and I think that the, the point of your book, as, as, you're, as you're noting, is, is really, you know, how do we think about Darwin before he becomes Darwin with a capital D? Um, so I, I'm wondering if, if, if you can maybe talk a little bit about um, whether you see uh, others sort of uplifting him as, as, as this kind of figurehead. That you know, he you make the point that this is a misconception that be, that he's the prominent naturalist, the official naturalist on the Beagle. That this is something that is ascribed to him later on in his career. Do you see in the construction of this book and in the research that you've done, um, others who are sort of ascribing Darwin with the celebrity persona, or is it one that he's seeking for himself? I would say that he. Um... Well, when he departs on the, the Beagle, he certainly is a, um, an unknown. But he, he's an unknown with substantial connections in, in the British establishment of, of scientists and museum curators and such. Um, his um, first of his mentors is uh, John Henslow, who's, who's a Cambridge professor. I mean, he's corresponding with him throughout the voyage. And by the time um, they're sailing back to England, Henslow is, is making these contacts on Darwin's behalf it's, it, and it, uh, he arranges for the publication of some of his letters in a scientific journal. So, but, um, and, he, uh, and he's sort of spreading Darwin's name among the establishment. So. Within months of his return, he's he's sort of on his way. He's he's inducted into uh, you know these all these prestigious scientific societies and et cetera. And and uh, um, so he sort of hits the ground running. I mean, he's he's making these connections and um, corresponding with scientists, and uh, and he's also working on you know he starts working on uh, this uh, what became the book we know, Voyage of the Beagle. Um, which which Fitzroy, the captain, actually invited him to contribute to kind of toward the end of the voyage. Um, th that said, as, as far as the, his, he sort of realized what he had like uh, within a, a year or two after returning I mean, he was, he was, this theory was coming into shape, but he, he was very ambivalent about whether to, um, 
pursue it. I mean, it, one of his letters, he, he writes to somebody that, that to, to, to assert the implications of this theory, he said, he said it was like, quote, confessing to, a, it would be like confessing to a murder. He realized that his, it would, uh, the theological implications of it and his family's standing uh, socially and otherwise in, 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 um, in local society and in, in Britain. And he, it's basically, he, he sort of um, avoids publishing it until like the late 1850, or 18, yeah, late 1850s when he learns that Alfred Lord, Alfred Russell Wallace is, is, is um, working in, in um, Malay, has the same, basically the same theory. And his um, mentor Henslow says, you know, you need to, get on this or, or you're going to be um, upstaged for posterity. Now, this is a great segue. There's several questions coming in now, uh, specifically about why he waited so long and, and also about uh, whether it might have to do with, as you say, the, the kind of more creationist outlook um, that, that he, he has after his journey. So um, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about the conflict with, with Darwin's religious views and, and how that contributed to, to the delay in, in the publication of The Origin, or if there's other factors that, that are perhaps less well um, written about in, in the current scholarship uh, on, on its publication? You know, I personally don't have the impression Darwin was particularly religious. I mean, he had agreed, maybe this is back up, it's got a minute, um, he, by the time he was in his adolescence and, and teens, he, he had developed what his father kind of considered uh, bad habits. He was, he, he was interested in, in um, riding and shooting, hunt, hunting and stuff. And rather than ha he had, he didn't have what his father considered to be serious interests. And he was and he was sort of um, not doing well in the uh, local boarding school that he was attending. So his father had this idea that, well, I'll pull him out of this school and we'll, I'll make him an apprenticeship doctor. He can help me with my practice and we'll see what happens there. And he did pretty well at that. And so his father said, okay, well, we'll send you now to, to Edinburgh, which is where his father had trained, his father, Darwin's father, Robert, had trained as well as his uh, grandfather, Erasmus. Um, but so he went to Edinburgh to, to study medicine, but uh, it turns out he, he was squeamish. He couldn't stand the sight of blood. So he, he washes out of there and leaves after a year. And his father says, well, you gotta do something. You can't spend your life. In this. And he said, how about this? He had this idea that he would purchase for him a parish priesthood in the Anglican church. And um, that would give him, that, that was not a very demanding position. He would have a sinecure, you know, sinecure with a, a perks, including, you know, residency and whatever, uh, paid housing. And that would leave lots of time for his pursuit of natural history. I mean, that was, that was a well-trod road among British, a lot of British naturalists were, were, were actually nominally theologians, priests. Um, so I'm sorry, what was the, I'm, I'm lost my train. I think we were sort of talking about why there was such a delay. Uh, in, oh, oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah, it was talking about, yeah. But anyway, I think, so Darwin, after pondering that offer um, before, between his attendance enrollment at Cambridge and, and leaving um, Edinburgh, he finally decides that he could r rationalize. I mean, he has this these uh, sort of he, he goes over this doctrine of the Anglican Church and says, "Well, I can, yeah, I could, I could see that, you know." But it's it's um, he he never really I never since he had any genuine passion for that subject. It was just like I I could I could do this I could manage this but without feeling like a hypocrite, but he, he never really, I, ne I never sensed he really was uh, looking forward to doing that. Um, 
And then by the time he returns, he's, he's decided that um, he's going to do something else besides that. He's, he's going to be a naturalist. Um, but but um, he was never interested in, in, um, in teaching or anything like that. But also, you know, he had the he he also knew that his family, if um, if he wanted to, he wouldn't have to work. I mean, he could be of independent means. Actually, his father ended up his his father did not want him to just assume that. But once once he he was sort of established on his way, his dar his father said, you know, you know, you really don't have to work. You don't have to earn an income. We, you know, the the family estate can can pay for this, but he didn't, he didn't want to tell him that until he saw he was doing something with his life. Yeah. Actually showing that there was, there was a reason for yeah, having him go on this father, journey. You know? His father initially opposed his, his joining the Beagle expedition. That's uh, right. Uh, yeah. Because he, he just thought it was another dodge from, you know, having a responsible life. It was just postponing having a family, finding a, a suitable profession and yeah. So actually, there, there's a question I would love to ask before before we run out of time, which is, you know, what was he doing when, when he was not doing his naturalist work on board the Beagle? Do you have any sense of, of kind of the life on the ship? Was it very solitary? Was it a convivial atmosphere? Did you are, are these are these diaries and letters resources for, for capturing that kind of uh, uh, culture as well? Or is it really more personal accounts? Yeah, there's some of the 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 I mean what what he called the chit chat details of the of the uh, um, diaries that find their way. I mean, I I use them extensively. He, he doesn't, uh, you know, as he says, he doesn't use those in the Voyage of the Beagle. Uh, but yeah, you, you I mean, I would have liked more of that in his diary. But he he, he is his his diaries are more personal. And you do have a sense of his like fluctuations of his mood and and who he's not who he's getting getting on with and, and not getting on with and uh, the tensions between him and the captain Fitzroy are also kind of interesting. Of course, those are not at all in the uh, the published the, the book he published. Um, but also, I just well, this is a small matter. He, he, I mean, you we don't think of him as as a, I mentioned that he. He, he, one of the things he talks about is shopping. We don't think of Charles Darwin. We think of him, a lot of things, a lot of words come to mind when you think of Charles Darwin, but I, I think great shopper is, is not. <laughs> but I mean, he remember he did spend time in, in cities um, in, in um, Sydney, Australia, and, or, or New South Wales, it was his then, um, and uh, um, Rio de, de Janeiro, Buenos Aires, Santiago, Chile. I mean, there were there were cities, and he he would uh, you know you know he buy he buy things. He also uh, you know at one point in several he um, he actually um, lives with a in a house in in Chile with a with a, um, a Br another British expatriate for several months. As well as he rents a cottage outside of Rio, so so there were these re, re, you know extended residencies. No, I, this this is great, and there's so many more questions, and I think we have time to to get to today. And I'll I'll be sure to share with Tom all of these questions after today's program, uh, with the hopes that he'll spend some time uh, in, engaging with them, so that we can we can feature them on our website. I guess just to, as a way to to conclude. Um, you know, is there is there one you've talked about these these five misconceptions uh, about about Darwin, but I, I guess I'm wondering is there a, is there a is there a piece of, of evidence that you see in putting together this 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 book that does ring true for the kind of celebrity of Darwin that comes out after the fact? Do you do you see the through line that kind of uh, that we think of sort of our, our, our own creation moments or the stories that we tell about ourselves when we're meeting people for the first time. Do you, do you, do you see those little bits of, 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 of details as well? Or are you mostly interested in, in finding, fi finding things that contradict the narratives that we have about Darwin? I, I think he was... I 
I think he, in some ways he relished fame, but he also uh, was reluctant uh, about uh, um, about it, uh, about pursuing it. For instance, he, he, uh, he never, he, he let others defend his theory in public. He, he never debated the, the, the uh, theory of evolution. He let Huxley and his, you know, allies, um, and he also never um, um, pursued um, you know, university positions. Early on in his career, Charles Lyell in a, a kind of candid aside to him told him to sort of avoid uh, taking on any um, like offices in honorary society or scientific societies basically said, you know, just stick to your work. This, this stuff is just taxing. It's um, it will cut into your work. I'm not sure if I answered your, your questions. No, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm interested if, if there's some, some little tidbit uh, that, that, that's, that you read and you're like, Oh yeah, that's Darwin. Like that, that to a, that to a T sort of explains who this man would become in the later years of his life. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I think that does. I mean, those qualities to which he alluded when he talks about his his uh, throughout his life, he's had a, a a keen sense of observation and and a sort of desire to. Uh, see patterns. I mean that that comes through from the very very beginning. Even from his 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 childhood, he's he's uh, kind of cataloging things intellectually. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. Well, uh, unfortunately, I think we're out of time. Um, but we will put the link again to purchase a copy of Tom's book in the chat. So uh, if you haven't already picked up your copy. Um, we will encourage you to do that. In the meantime, uh, Tom, thank you again so much for, for joining us. Uh, it was really a pleasure to have you here. Uh, and again, uh, hope that you'll have some time to come visit us and explore our Darwin materials as well. We'd love to hear your take on, on what we how what we have uh, aligns with what you've already had some time to work through. So um, thanks again. Be well, well everyone. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to get to, um, I see there's like 20, 20 questions or so. Up there. I'll, I'll try to get to as many as I can. Great. And we'll uh, share the link to, to those questions after you've had a chance to go through them uh, with the recording of this video. So please uh, check back in a couple of weeks. And uh, thanks so much again. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank, again, I thank everyone who tuned in for this. I appreciate your interest. Okay. Take care. Okay.